Um, so we're now going to move on to Ellie Quinn. Um, she's a very esteemed colleague from the uh, Royal Brompton Hospital. Um, lots of experience in cardiac genetic counselling um, and has recently expanded her role to provide um, counselling for families with inherited respiratory conditions as well. Um, research interests include the genetics of inherited cardiac conditions and she's a big proponent for the modernisation of genetic counselling through uh, technology such as video confer conferencing apps and online. Um, and Ellie's going to talk to us today about genetic counselling in ICCs, uh, when to test and who should perform the counselling. Thank you very much, Ellie. Hi, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, shall I, I'll just share. Do I need to wait for the other slides to be unshared, maybe? Let's have a look. I think you can just share, Ali, try. Yeah. Can I? Yeah, there you go. Perfect. So we can see, oh, that's it, they're in presentation mode. Right I'm now. in Thank presentation you. mode, yes. Okay, great. Um, so, bear with me, I'm just going to da, 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 get myself set up. So, yes, I have been invited to talk to you all today a bit about when to do genetic testing and who should perform the counselling for genetic testing. So I thought um, today we could talk a little bit, a bit of a brief overview on the types of genetic testing that we do in inherited cardiac conditions, um, cover some kind of considerations that um, I have when I'm doing genetic testing and use some case examples for that and then um, covering kind of the process of genetic counselling, why genetic counselling is done, who does genetic counselling and when when it's sort of needed and when it's appropriate and I kind of thought it might be useful to talk a bit about some models so I think in the talk previously there was talk about service design and similarly there's different models for sort of offering genetic testing including mainstreaming so we could talk a bit about that today as well. So um, just as a brief overview of genetic testing in inherited cardiac conditions, some of you may already have a lot of experience in this, but maybe not others. So I thought it'd be good to talk about that initially. Um, so in general, um, it's divided up into kind of three different types of testing. So our bread and butter really is diagnostic testing, which is when a patient has a known inherited cardiac condition and they come to us and there is no known genetic cause at that point. So we would do a diagnostic test, which is a genetic panel, usually with a number of different genes to see if we could pinpoint the genetic cause of the inherited cardiac condition for them. And generally with this type of testing, we, there's three possible results. So the first is that we have um, an, a genetic cause identified. So a pathogenic or a likely pathogenic variant is found. And that opens up the possibility of genetic testing for family members. We may find no genetic cause from the testing, um, which isn't necessarily to say it's not genetic, it could be a gene we haven't even discovered yet that's not on our panel. So we do quite often get a, a negative result from the panel and we can sometimes get an inconclusive result as well, which is that we find a variant of unknown significance uh, from the diagnostic test. So um, that's kind of the first line testing when we have a program presenting to us with an inherited cardiac condition. If we have a known genetic variant in a family, we then may do a type of testing called segregation. So if there's more than one person who's affected with an inherited cardiac condition, we would then um, test for the known genetic variant in them as well to confirm that they also carry it. And we can do this with pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants, but we can also do it with variants of unknown significance as well and segregation testing can be really important when we have variants of unknown significance because it can help us understand better if that particular variant is disease causing or if it's actually a bit of a red herring because if we find that someone who has the disease in the family doesn't carry the variant it makes it much less likely that it's pathogenic so lots of my work is kind of organizing segregation testing in other affected family members and then an important part of the work of a genetic counsellor is talking about predictive testing. So that's in patients who, as far as we know, don't have an inherited heart condition, but they is a known pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant in a family member. 
and they're having a test to see if they have inherited that variant, which would essentially predict whether they have an increased chance of developing that condition in the future and whether they need to have ongoing cardiac screening. So this can be quite a different discussion to the one you'd have with a diagnostic test because you may have someone who's completely well and um, the question is whether they want that information because actually um, it, you know, it could be something that causes them a lot of anxiety or anguish. Um, for other people, it can be something that um, puts them at ease because that they, they now know where they stand. So it's a discussion with them to try and pick apart whether it's the right thing for them to have the test at this point in time. So I've put here some things that I would usually consider when I'm um, thinking about organising a genetic test for someone. So firstly, um, in terms of practical considerations, a genetic test is a cost to the NHS and it's also a cost to the patient in terms of their time. Um, they would need to have usually a blood sample taken. Is this test actually going to provide useful information for the patient and their family? So firstly, is this test going to be useful? Um, secondly, I want to think, am I testing the right person in this family? I usually want to test the person with the most clear cut or the most severe phenotype because that can be the most informative when doing a genetic test. And then thirdly, are we doing the right test? So we want to ensure that the panel we're doing is broad enough to hopefully cover the all the genes that could be indicated with the patient's particular phenotype but we don't want to do a panel that's so broad that we come back with unexpected results that we weren't looking for or maybe lots of variants of unknown significance that are difficult to interpret so it's about getting the right panel and getting the right size of panel as well and then in terms of psychosocial considerations, um, it's important to explore with the patient and their family whether they are at a place where they're prepared to get these type of genetic results. Um, as many of you will have experienced working in inherited cardiac conditions, it can be a very fraught time for families, especially when someone has passed away suddenly. And so um, it can be a, a matter of timing. Is this actually the right time to do the test and are you ready for the results? Also, it's important for me to establish that the patient and family fully understand the testing. They have um, a clear expectation of what the results might be. And as so they're making an informed choice about testing and also to explore whether there are any ish, um, ethical issues with doing the test as well. So I thought I'd use some case examples um, for some of these considerations. So first one. Um, so in this case, I've been referred a 40 year old woman and um, I've been asked to organise some genetic testing for her for ARVC. So she has a family history of ARVC because her brother had a heart transplant at the age of 18. And she's actually already had some cardiac scans, which showed some borderline features of ARVC on the scans. Um, so I was asked to organise genetic testing with her. Um, and I th had to think to myself, should I do a test for her? And if so, what test would I do? So what I would decide to do in this instance is actually to test her brother if possible. Um, and the reason is the brother has a much more clear cut and severe phenotype than the woman who was referred to me. And so doing a genetic test in him would be more, more informative than testing her originally. And actually, in this case, when we tested the brother, we found that he had two gen pathogenic genetic variants in desmoplakin and placophyllin genes. Um, and whereas his sister actually only carried one variant. So if I'd started by testing his sister, we would have only picked up the desmoplakin variant and not the placophyllin. So if we were testing other family members, something could have been missed there. If we tested the sister, then tested the brother, but just tested him for the desmoplakin, we wouldn't know about the placophyllin and we could have potentially, you know, done predictive testing on his daughter and discharged her when there's actually a second variant in the family. So that's why it's really important to, if possible, to test the most severely, clearly affected person in the family. 
So another case example here, um, an eight year old girl was referred to me because there was a history of long QT syndrome in her paternal family. Um, her grandfather has a pathogenic KCNQ1 variant. She attended uh, the appointment with her mother and she actually has two younger brothers as well, which are who were due to be referred for checks as well. Um, and it turns out when talking to the family that dad um, said he's not going to get the test because he's he's not too worried about himself. He's just worried about his children. So this girl has been referred to me for a test. She's at risk of long QT syndrome. Should I test her? And what test should I do? So in this instance, I said, let's hold off testing for her right now. We really need to test dad originally. And um, it, once you explain this to families, usually they're pretty on board with this. Um, you can explain that if we tested this little girl and she was positive for the variant, we've essentially tested dad without consulting him. And also kind of from, again, a money and a time perspective, if we test dad and he's negative, we don't need to test any of these children. So it's also it's an ethical issue, but it's also a practical issue as well that we could save testing three children if we could just test dad originally and it, so usually I in this instance I would try and facilitate a referral for dad to be tested if dad is completely AWOL and we can't get in touch with him then that's another discussion but if he's available for a testing and he's open to that then we can have that discussion with with him okay and then this third case is a bit about timing so I have a 32 year old woman who's presented with a VF arrest of unknown cause she's currently unconscious in the ITU of our hospital there's a family history of sudden death in her father of unknown cause um, so asked to organize genetic testing for this lady so the question is should we test her and what test would we be doing for her so in this instance, when someone is acutely unwell um, and, you know, they've just had a cardiac arrest, we still don't know exactly what the cause was. We usually try and store DNA initially because um, that means we are kind of preserving the possibility of doing genetic testing in the future when we have a bit more clarity and it's not such an acutely difficult situation for the family. The family members are going to be in a lot of turmoil. She's in a very unstable situation in ITU, so it may not be a good time to talk with them. And also this woman, she may actually regain capacity to consent to genetic testing in the future, um, or she could potentially pass away, or she could survive, but if she has some brain damage, she may not regain the capacity to consent so all of these things is kind of an unknown at the moment and sometimes when there's so many unknowns and it's such an acutely difficult situation for the family it's best just to store and then revisit a bit when things have kind of settled down a bit and we know where we stand so um coming to into my role as a genetic counselor so I usually break this up into kind of four different aspects. So genetic counselling in this essence is um, thought of as education for patients. So um, talking about those complex genetic aspects that can be um, quite hard to get your head around sometimes and helping patients understand them, communicating it in a really clear way so they can make informed decisions. And then the counselling aspect is the, the fact that we can have those discussions without um, usually guiding the patients in sense we're allowing them to make their own informed choices and exploring their own feelings about testing and and other aspects of having a genetic condition. In inherited cardiac conditions, um, I often think of facilitation as um, not only helping patients to navigate the health service, but also supporting them in sharing information with family members and getting family members checked as well. So um, I think it's great that the AICC have this um, directory now of services because when family members are across the UK, across the globe, getting that information, sharing it and making sure that everyone is being checked can be really difficult. Um, and we're there to kind of support them through that process as well. But am I the only person in the team who is doing genetic counselling? I would argue not. Um, so 
I think when I was asked to do this talk today, I guess the question was who consents to genetic testing? And I would say in my experience of working in an ICC team that um, many different members of the team perform genetic counselling um, throughout throughout their time in their role because they all have knowledge of genetics that being that from down from the consultants to the registrars to the clinical nurse specialists and um, patients will be coming to them with questions that have a basis within genetics you know that these are all patients with potentially inherited conditions so genetic counseling doesn't just come from me it comes from the whole team and I view my role within the ICC team as someone who's um, not only supporting patients but supporting the ICC team as a whole to offer genetic counseling to patients because they may not be sure on something and I can guide them on that and then they can they can roll it out to the patient so it's not just me it's it's the whole team that does that I guess the question is, um, how do we actually um, set this up within our service in terms of the actual consent form and, and the patients being sort of counselled formally in an appointment? Is that something that's done by a genetic counsellor or is that something that's done by a clinician such as a doctor or a nurse? So there's been a lot of change in the NHS um, over the past few years and a real big drive and initiative to mainstream genetic testing, essentially to make genetic testing accessible to patients through allowing um, clinicians throughout specialties to access genetic testing and request it for their patients through the National Genomic Test Directory. So the patients don't all have to go through a clinical genetic service. It can actually be requested within their medical team. So I've just put here two publications from the NHS, the Genomic Test Directory and this Genomic Me Medicine Initiative, just showing that there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes to make um, genomic medicine an embedded part of the whole NHS, not just part of the genetic services. So there are different ways of setting up a service model. And as I've mentioned, the more traditional model um, would have been that the ICC team would refer the patient to their local regional genetic service um, if they wanted to have genetic testing. The patient would be seen by a genetic counsellor. They would be given their genetic results by a genetic counsellor, and then they would be discharged back to the ICC service. So this model has its benefits because um, you know, there's not as much of a burden on the ICC team to um, counsel the patients. It's a time burden. Um, it's a knowledge burden as well that they would need to have sort of the, enough knowledge about the genetic testing process to do that consent. But there are um, drawbacks from this as well. So there's obviously the time. So if we have to refer to another um, a service like a regional genetic service that um, may result in delays to the patient accessing genetic testing. There can be a bottlenecking where there's only a small number of genetic professionals within that service and a lot of patients being referred from ICC. And so um, it can make it more difficult and patients can just get lost in the system. And there can be less continuity of care when a patient is seen in multiple different departments. So the move now is to different models of um, offering genetic testing within the ICC team. So um, the way we have things set up at the Brompton is a bit more like an integrated model, I've called it here. So I'm the genetic counsellor that's based in the ICC team. I'm still the one who's usually the consenting the patients. Some of the consenting is done by doctors and nurses, but usually it's by me. And I'm the one who's feeding back the results. But all of this is integrated within the ICC team. So I'm um, as I'm working alongside ICC professionals, any results that can have implications for the patient's care, for example, can be brought quickly to an MDT meeting and reviewed. So it's kind of a bit more of a holistic model and it has more continuity of care for patients. And then another model um, which other services are moving towards or is a more mainstream model where the consent rather than having an embedded genetic counsellor is actually done by an ICC professional, be that a, a doctor or a clinical nurse specialist who's doing the consent. They would give the patient the results and then um, for some services what they do is if the panel the diagnostic test comes back positive then the patient is then referred to regional genetics to um, talk through the result in a bit more detail and organise cascade screening for family members. So this isn't all the models there are even more different models and ways of doing things um, but I think there's a lot of talk at the moment of the best way of setting this 
up so that as ICC services, we can ensure that um, patients are able to access genetic testing in a timely way, but they're still getting the appropriate level of um, discussion and consent conversation. So they're making an informed choice about genetic testing. So um, that's all I was going to cover today. Um, I can answer some questions for everyone in the panel discussion if you have any. Thank you for having me. Thanks very much, Ellie. That was a really comprehensive and informative talk, much appreciated. Um, and as you said, we will save any questions until the, the chat at the end.